welcome to Sewing with Nancy, TV's how-to sewing program with your host, Nancy Zeman. This educational videotape is being brought to you in part by FOF, the largest European producer of sewing machines. FOF's creative line of sewing machines and hobby lock sergers are simply the best. By Pellon, the first name in interfacing and craft material, and the first choice of home sewers for professional results. Pellon, products by Freudenberg. By Ginger, a tradition of quality in scissors and shears for home, classroom, and industry. Ginger scissors and shears are the choice of professionals. And by Nancy's Notions Catalog, featuring specialty sewing books and unique, hard-to-find sewing notions and supplies. Now, here's Nancy Zeman. Welcome to Sewing with Nancy and to our program on the best of tailoring. Over the last 11 years of doing Sewing with Nancy programs, I've given several programs on tailoring. Well, in this program, I'm going to combine the, my favorite techniques over the years and give you the best tailored jacket you can make. Now, tailoring takes a little bit of time, but here's the finished result. A great looking jacket, completely lined, and the details to put it together are fairly simple, just following these step by steps. The first section is working with interfacings, fusible interfacings, to save some time. The general interfacing is going to be lightweight to give overall shape and support. Notice how lightweight this and drapeable this interfacing appears. The second interfacing is more crisp. It's very stiff, and it's going to be used in the roll line and under collar. It doesn't have any drape to give that extra support. It will save doing a lot of hand work. So I'm going to sit up at the table and show you the details of making the best tailored jacket with fusible interfacings. The first step for a best tailored jacket is to work with the interfacing. As I mentioned, we're going to have two weights, a very crisp weight and then a general all-over weight. The general all-over weight is what I'd like to discuss first of all. It's a very drapeable interfacing available either in the off-white or the charcoal color. Again, it has a lot of su adds support to the garment, but not stiffness. This interfacing is going to be practically on every fabric piece. You'll need about a yard and a half to two yards, depending upon the style of this interfacing. Check the back of the envelope to be sure. But before actually cutting out the interfacing, I'm going to make a quick sample run of using a scrap of fabric, a little square of the interfacing, and testing it on the fabric, just putting the two together. Remember, remember this is a scrap, just a test. But a hint is to put another piece of fabric between the interfacing and the fashion fabric. When fusing, follow the manufacturer's instructions. Place a damp, fab damp cloth over the fabric and press this the allotted amount of time. When pressing this, what you'll do is get a couple of tests by doing this sample. You'll, all, you'll be able to test if the bond was correct by pulling on this tab. If it pulls off, obviously you need to press longer. But most importantly at this point, you can check the, the compatibility of the interfacing and the fashion fabric. And that's what we really need to check right now to see if that's the one you should use. If not, if it's too crisp, go lighter. Now, when making the interfacing pattern pieces, I like to use waxed paper. And for the jacket front, the piece that will have the most interfacing, I have two layers that have just been fused together with the tip of my iron. It will give you nice, wide wax paper. And then I have, I'm going to be using a gauge. I think many of you may have one of these in your sewing box where you can slide the gauge. Here we're going to slide it to a half of an inch. This will allow us to get rid of the interfacing a half of an inch into the seam, leaving just a little, an eighth of an inch, so that you can catch it with your stitching line. All around the seam lines, I guide one point along the cutting line. The next point will scratch off the wax. Now I'm working on a padded surface, another layer of fabric, tablecloth, whatever you may have, and just scratch off the wax and get your interfacing shape all the way around doesn't take a lot of time, but it gives a nice accurate pattern piece. Now the darts do not require any interfacing at all. It will just add bulk to the dart area. So place a ruler or a straight edge and trace away the interfacing from the dart. And I have two darts right now, I'll just show you on this smaller dart. That would be cut away. Now the hemline is the other area where we're going to address the interfacing on the front since we have what's called a full fuse, interfacing practically the full width, I like the interfacing to go just a touch into the hem, about an eighth of an inch. Rather than stopping at the hemline, you could get a brisk line, a very sharp line. 
if we extend it about an eighth to a fourth of an inch into the hemline, just trace this, you'll have a much softer hem. It will look very tailored, very nice. So these are the guidelines for making the full fuse. Eliminate the interfacing a half of an inch from the seam allowances, eliminate it from the dart, and extend it an eighth to a fourth of an inch into the hemline. Now you can cut out the interfacing for this particular piece, and I'll give you some fusing tips. Now interfacing on a jacket takes about, a, oh, I'd say a good half an hour to press it on. So this is not a speed technique as far as you're going to make a jacket tonight. It's a process, but I think it's an interesting process and kind of fun to work with the fabric. Here we have a jacket front, and I have steam basted the interfacing to the wrong side of the fabric. Steam basting means before actually doing the fusing, use the tip of your iron to position the interfacing so it's not going to shift during the fusing process. Notice that the interfacing is minus a half of an inch in the seam allowances, eliminated from the dart. It is generally in the right position. Then after you have it kind of steam basted, I'll move it to my ironing board. You may want to do this on your ironing board. But mine is a little smaller than my one at home. Have it nice and flat on the ironing board and cover it with a damp cloth. It's crucial to use a damp press cloth. My iron is set at wool and I'm going to press for 10 seconds. Count to 10, 1,001, 1,002, and make certain that you are applying pressure. This is the area that's so often missed, is to apply pressure to the iron to advance that bonding. Then overlap slightly where you press the last time, and press another 10 seconds. When I'm pressing at home, I actually lower my ironing board so I can lean into it to give it a proper bond, and just keep working down the jacket front and fuse it in place. And you can see this does take sl a slight amount of time, but after you have pressed it, it gives a nice bond and this is very drapeable, extremely workable. Besides full fusing the, cent the garment front, there are other pieces that will get the full fuse. The collar and the facing are other areas that will have the interfacing included except the seam allowances. Here's the upper collar, we'll discuss the under collar a little bit later, and the front facing piece. So you can see we have it included in these pieces minus the seam allowances. Now part of the other jacket pieces will have a partial fuse. The jacket back is what I'm going to work with next. And the jacket back will have interfacing just in the shoulder area. And I'll grab my little gauge again, starting at the underarm, slide it back to that half of an inch, about two inches below the underarm, and trace around the armhole, shoulder, neckline, and center back. The interfacing is just left in the seam allowance an eighth of an inch. And then at the center back, I'm going to scoot this down to two inches below the underarm area. So it's partially fused into place. Then the jacket itself looks like this after it's been fused. This is the way ready-to-wear works with the interfacing, giving it shape in the shoulder. Obviously, the garment hangs from your shoulder. That's where it needs the most support. The hem does need additional support. The hem of the sleeves would apply in the same manner. Here we have interfacing in the hem allowance. Now, this interfacing has been trimmed away a half an inch or so from the side seams, but it's also cut on the bias. Now, bias cut interfacing has more support and more shaping ability. The hem generally has curve and shaping, so that's why we cut this on the bias. Notice this strip has more give than if it were cut on the straight of grain. My hem allowance on the pattern was an inch and three-fourths. I cut this a slight bit wide, about an inch and seven-eighths to two inches, and fused it into the jacket back, the sleeves, and also it could be fused into the side panel if you had a panel such as this. Again, we're fusing it beyond the hemline so that as that jacket is pressed, it gives a nice roll to the hem, to the hem edge. In my interleaf, you know that section that comes on the bolt, the directions that are wrapped around the interfacing, I've kept some of those instructions and made a pouch for my interfacing. If I have leftover interfacings, I simply place it into the pouch, just stitching the side seams. I have an extra bias strip or two, so that the next time I need 
in the interfacing for our jacket in the hemline. It's kept safely in this pouch, and I have the directions close at hand. So now you need to fuse on the jacket back, all the other pieces that need some shaping in the hemline, and then it's time to do a second layer fusing, and that's what I'm going to set up to do right now. The next step of double fusing only takes place on two areas of the jacket, the lapel and roll line of the under collar. The reason for using a crisper weight of interfacing on top of the original layer of interfacing will allow the jacket to have more stability and stand up in the lapel and roll line where most of the detail of a tailored jacket is found. As I mentioned, this interfacing you'll find in your fabric store catalog and it will note where it should be used. It's much crisper than the all over interfacing. Look on your jacket pattern for the roll line marking. It's that bias line above the buttonhole section angling up into the neckline. We'd like the jacket when it's finished to roll right at that line, to have a break line, not sharp, but a nice soft roll. To encourage that roll, I'm going to place another layer of wax paper, align it with the roll line, but then back off about a fourth or an eighth of an inch, just so that there is a difference between the two. Notice it's not much, a fourth or an eighth, but wherever it ends, and that's where the break line will take place. I'll position this on the pattern front. Now this is, I usually make this after I have made the original all over interfacing for the jacket front. Now as you might guess, we're going to do that same tracing using the gauge, guiding one point along the cutting line and the other one along the, we'll scratch off the wax, giving the marking for the interfacing. I'll be cutting along this inner line. And I'll just continue down into the roll line section. Now for the grain line, that's something I really like to point out. This grain line needs to be marked both on the all over interfacing using the same grain line and on the second layer of interfacing. To keep it the same grain line, just simply use my sewing gauge again, align the gauge with the arrow and then slide just so that I can transfer the marking. You can measure whatever you'd like to do just so that you get the grain line transferred. I'll just extend it up into the jacket, just like that. So this is the pattern piece that I'll use to cut two layers, one for the left side, one for the right side, of that jacket front. After that first interfacing has been fused in place, then we can apply the second layer. So I mentioned this is not a speedy process. I don't make too many line blazers in the course of the year. But when I make one, I usually make it out of fabric that I'll use, wear and use for many years, like the one I'm wearing. Simply place this interfacing following the same cutting line in the seam allowances, but then notice this grain line. And we'll transfer it to our ironing board and give it a good press. Using this, following the same interfacing fusing techniques that you'll find on the bolt end, damp cloth, steam, iron set at a wool setting for 10 seconds, and just keep pressing. This is really quite quick, and I'm not quite giving it the full 10 seconds, but because it's in this area, you'll then see that it's very crisp and nice in this area. Now to follow this through to the under collar is important because the roll line does not stop on the jacket front. Here you can see how this is breaking, and you can see how the fold occurs after the interfacing has been put into place. And now for the under collar, we're going to do the same type of interfacing. Here's my interfacing pattern piece for, that I'm going to make for the under collar. But one thing I didn't mention about the under collar is the full fuse, the first layer. I mentioned the top layer, but not the bottom. Out of the crisp, crisp interfacing, cut the full fuse. Not the general, just that crisp. This is really quite stiff. And then sew the center back seam and trim that seam to 3 eighths of an inch. Trim it so it's smaller. This has this general interfacing on it. Generally applied, I should say, but it is the crisp interfacing, not the all over, because this area of the jacket has the most wear and tear. Now in making this second layer of interfacing, I have my wax paper folded in half and the fold is aligned right now at the center back. I'm not going to put a seam in this area. So it's aligned at the center back. 
and I'll grab my gauge once again. And this roll line is marked on the collar. Measure a fourth to an eighth of an inch from the roll line toward the neckline away from the roll line. Again, so I'll have that great break line and trace. And then do the same tracing at the lower edge. This is a small piece. Now for the interfacing grain, we're going to deviate from the pattern's grain line. Notice that this had a bias cut. We're going to put the grain, it's on the fold, so it will be parallel with the fold. I have a little arrow just drawn on there. This will be placed on the fold. And when I cut this out, the interfacing is shaped like this, very crisp. It was cut on the fold of the fabric. As I place it here, you can see the grain line, how it has, it will be follow the fold. Once you cut this, simply match it to the, to the collar, positioning it. Position it in the correct manner. There we go. And now we'll press it onto the collar. Cover it with a damp cloth. And give it, again, a nice quick fuse. Now, almost all of the interfacing has been put into place. The double fusing on the under collar and on the jacket front, and the full fusing on the other pattern pieces. And notice how this is covering the center back seam line, and now we can do some shaping. You know, part of tailoring is not only pressing interfacings, doing sewing, but also steaming and shaping. You need an iron that steams well, and obviously some pressing tools. I'm going to be working with a pressing ham and ham holder to work with the shaping of the undercollar. As I mentioned, this is one of the areas that needs the most support and shape. I just have my pressing ham, dressmaker ham in this section, and I'm going to be folding the interface, excuse me, the undercollar along the roll line. Notice again how this will break or, or, or will roll right after the double fusing has been marked. And I'll Fold this around the ham. Let me just pin this from the underside and shape it around the ham. The ham has a comparable shape to a, your neckline. Sneak another pin in there. And as I kind of turn this ham holder, you'll see that this break line is where your collar will shape. A nice shaping. Now, this does not require pressing. Pressing is meeting the iron surface to the fabric. Rather, it's steaming to give the shape. We don't want a sharp line. So get your iron pressing, holding it parallel to the fabric, to the ironing board, and then just simply give this a nice steam, trying to avoid to get direct contact to the fabric. And we'll turn it around to the front. I'm just going to move this pin a little the front and now do another steaming. But if you hold your iron parallel with the floor or to the ironing board, then you'll get that to steam well and the moisture will absorb into the fabric. You can kind of mold it with your hand. We'll do the same on the other side. And that will continue that roll line from the jacket front to the under collar. Leave this on your pressing ham and hold it in your ham holder for a while. It needs to dry so that it will dry into that shape. But after you've gotten this far, all your interfacing is in place. We've worked with the jacket front with two layers of interfacing, the under collar with two layers, and every other layer or every other fabric piece has interfacing applied somewhere on it. That will give the shape and the beginning to working with a tailored jacket. I hope you've enjoyed this first part of our program on the best of tailoring. I like getting to this point because after getting my interfacing fused in the place, I have determined I'm about a third of the way finished with my jacket. Just as a quick review, I use Pellon's soft shape for the general overall interfacing, almost every pattern piece or fabric piece. And the very crisp interfacing with the lapel and roll line of the undercolor is called Pellair. You're going to be working with these two in combination to get the best tailoring look. Don't forget to use your pressing tools. So press, so press. And here we have the under collar shaped around the pressing ham.
leave it that way until it's nice and dry. And the ham holder is a kind of a funny looking notion, but works so well like an extra hand when you're pressing on the ham because you don't have to hold the ham on the ironing board. So now that the interfacing is pressed in place, the next thing is to sew the jackets together. But before we do that, first a word from one of our national underwriters. Before we go on to the next project, I'd like to talk about one of the fine underwriters of Sewing with Nancy. I'm sure you've noticed that I use FOF sewing machines and serges exclusively in my television show and videotapes, and there's a good reason for it. FOF machines provide the reliable performance I need, and they're very easy to use. What's more, FOF stitch quality is exceptional. So whether I'm using a FOF creative model for elaborate fashion sewing or a hybrid lock serger for home deck work, I know I can count on my FOF to help me do my best sewing every time, and so can you. Your local FOF dealer is there to help and can show you the entire FOF line. Here's a message from Ginger, a national underwriter of my program. Ginger Incorporated manufactures the finest shears and scissors used by sewing enthusiasts across the country. Ginger products are valued for their tradition of excellence and quality. I rely on Ginger's shears and scissors for all my cutting needs. Ginger is recognized by sewing experts as a premier line of cutting tools in home sewing and needle arts. Look for Ginger scissors and shears at your favorite sewing center or in the latest Nancy's Notions catalog. Thanks for joining me for the second program of our series on the best of tailoring. These are my favorite tailoring techniques for a line jacket. Today's program, I'm going to show you how to take those fabric pieces that all have the interfacing fused onto them and place them into a jacket, actually two jackets, a lining unit and a fashion fabric jacket. First of all, I'm going to work with the fashion fabric jacket. Here you can see that jacket. All the pieces have been sewn together side seams, shoulder seams, the sleeves have been set in, and the under collar attached to the jacket. It basically has all the components of a jacket. Now for the lining unit. This again has side seams, shoulder seams, sleeves, and the upper collar attached to the facings. Both jackets have comparable components, and after sewing them, you're going to put them together into the completed finished jacket. Well, right now I'm going to get set up at my sewing machine and show you my favorite way of easing in sleeves, attaching the sleeve heads, and sewing in the shoulder pads. Some of the first sewing details of putting your jacket unit together involve stitching the shoulder seam, the underarm seam, and putting in whatever pocket your pattern calls for. It could be a patch pocket or a welt. But right now, the next detail is to work with the sleeve filling in the ease or sewing in the ease of the cap. Traditionally, you'd be asked to row, sew two rows of basting stitches from notch to notch. I'd like to sew just one. And here's how to go about it. Rather than having your dual feet connected, if you have one of these on your machine, disconnect it. If you have a walking foot, replace that and put on your traditional foot. And then set your machine to the standard stitch length. Straight stitch, I have my machine set at about 10 to 12 stitches per inch. At a 2.5 on my machine. Now I'm going to sew about, I would say, a half of an inch from the cut edge. The important placement is of a finger behind the presser foot, and I'm going to be pulling toward, toward me. And as I am kind of have my foot behind the presser foot and sew, notice the fabric that is gathering between my finger and the back of the foot. After you sew an inch or so, release a section, sew another section. The finger is stopping the fabric from going through the back of the machine, kind of an unnatural flow. But because of this, the feed dogs, those little teeth-like metal mechanisms underneath the presser foot, will cause more fabric to go in each stitch. And it works remarkably well. On most fabrics, you will find it, it eases in just the right amount. As with the traditional method, you'd be doing this between the two notches. Now we'll see how I did. One more time, there we are. When I pull this up, you'll be able to see how this has eased into place. And what a nice, slight cap shape I now have, rather than that flat fabric that you saw earlier. After you have this eased in, then place it right sides together, the sleeve, into the jacket, pinning around the armhole, and stitch. You can use your favorite stitching techniques or method you'd like to ease, 
ease and set in the sleeves, but I also recommend to do some understitching or a second row stitching under the arm. I've used turquoise thread as a contrast to show you this jacket, and you can see the 5 eighths of an inch stitching. But then when I get to the notch section, the underarm area, I've trimmed the seam to 3 eighths of an inch, and then notice a double row stitching two rows, one at the seam line, one a fourth of an inch from that line to give more security and shape in that underarm area. After sewing, you might guess we're going to do some pressing. And pressing the cap will give you the best look to the sleeve, but you have to be careful in pressing the cap. Place your jacket over a pressing hem. You're working with the wrong side facing you and press the seam allowances toward the sleeve. Now when I say press kind of in not literally, but just going to use the tip of your iron to press the seam allowance toward the sleeve. Don't flatten out the cap. If you would flatten it out, you'll have ridges or an imprint of the seam allowance on the wrong or on the right side. So just get that kind of roll edge shaped. And with your fingers, you may want to kind of get the shape pressed in. When I turn the jacket to the right side, you'll see what this accomplishes gets that nice little lip of the sleeve. We'll put a sleeve head in a few minutes to give it additional shape, but the cap hasn't been flattened. It has the proper shape for a tailored garment. And now the step next is to put in the sleeve head as well as shape it with a shoulder pad. A sleeve head is the next technique. It's a small little shaping device that makes a great difference in the look of your finished sleeve. This is made out of fleece, lightweight fleece. This is three inches wide by about 10 inches long, three by 10 for each sleeve. Fold under approximately one inch along the lengthwise edge and stitch a half of an inch or so from the fold. And on this sample, we have already done the stitching a half inch from the fold. Now it's time to set this into the armhole. Find the center of the sleeve head and place it at the shoulder seam. And here you can see I've already started to position this. And I have the fold of the sleeve head next to the cut edge of the seam allowance. The second layer, that layer that I turned under, is between, is between the fabric, or next to the fabric, I should say. I'm going to sew from the right side of the sleeve, following my initial stitching line when setting in the sleeve, just to put this in there. Now what this sleeve head does is allows the cap, the ease of the cap, some place for it to go, giving it some shape and padding. It's a small section, but it makes, as I mentioned earlier, a large difference in the way the sleeve will look. I kind of like this technique, too, because if you had any area when you were setting in your sleeve where you had a slight jut to the seam, you could straighten it with this row of stitching. It basically goes between the notches, and now I'm coming to the end area. When I show you the difference that this makes, just set in a simple row of stitching, you'll see that that extra fullness of the sleeve has some place to go. And it is rounded off and gives a very neat finish. It, doesn't, it isn't flat. The sleeve cap doesn't fall off the end because there's some padding and shape inserted in this area. The final shaping for the jacket unit is the shoulder pad. And I usually put the shoulder pad in right about now, rather than waiting to the end. It's easier to check the fit because you're not contending with the lining and place the straight edge of the shoulder pad, the straight edge next to the cut edge or the seam allowance of the sleeve. Now you have to put it inverted upside down because we're working with the wrong side of the fabric. This is quite a thick shoulder pad, but I wanted to show this to you for a specific reason that when we're attaching it, we don't want to have dimples occur. In other words, sewing too tightly that you get a dimple mark, which would transfer it to the right side. I'm going to tack this at the shoulder seam at each end on both sides, and one more time attaching it to the shoulder seam allowance at the curved edge, so there'll be four tackings. These tackings are done by machine. You can do them by hand, but I like to do things a little bit quicker by machine. Using a tailor tack foot or a fringe foot. This is a, given by that name. These are two alternatives. It has a metal bar, a raised metal bar in the center. And when the zigzag stitch goes over the bar, it creates a shank, a thread shank. Another alternative is to place a thread, a quilting bar, which came in my accessory box, over a traditional foot 
So again, as the machine zigzags, a thread shank is created. I'm going to use this quilting bar right now. The, the sleeve head is in place, and let me quickly give this pinning so I know where this will be positioned on both ends. You could try this on, obviously try it on to make sure they're in the right spots, but just generally is where it's going to be placed. And my machine is going to go to a wide zigzag and no stitch length. And I'm going to be sewing, again, in the seam allowance. I'm going to put that quilting bar over the top of my foot and just hold it into place and do that zigzag stitch. And it's just going over that area, creating a, a shank of a thread. Now as I lift this off, you'll see this great thread shank that will occur. And as I'm pulling this, there is a distance created about a half of an inch between the two. So it's a floating thread, uh, floating shoulder pad, but it will stay in position, but will not give the dimple effect that if you tack this too, too securely into place. On the other side, I have the finished shoulder pad all in place, tacked to the four times, one, two, three, and four. And as I bring it forward, the finishing details of the sleeve are now complete. And now for the collar. I'm going to attach the under collar to the jacket unit. Let me show you a close-up of how this will appear when we're finished with this step. The lapel and the under collar are attached to form this great roll line that you traditionally find on a tailor jacket. The first time I did this, I had to think twice. I wanted to put the upper collar to the jacket, but remember, this will be the underside. Match your notches and markings, but I'd like to give you a couple details of sewing this into place. On a sample jacket of contrasting collar and jacket, I have the interfacing pressed on this jacket. And notice that there is a faint mark. This is the large dot on your pattern indicating the lapel point, where the lapel and collar will intersect, probably the most important marking on a jacket. I usually mark this after I fuse the interfacing so that, obviously, the marking isn't covered. On the jacket itself, I have that same corresponding marking, so I know where those two dots should meet. Now, generally in sewing, there's room for a little fudge factor. But when working with the lapel and collar, it's important if you can be as close to accurate, because it will make putting these two garment units together much easier. I'm going to start to sew right at that lapel dot, and I'm sewing with the jacket facing me, the under collar toward the feed dog. Since that under collar has a curved seam, a slight curved seam, it's easier to put that on the under layer. You can manipulate it more readily. And I'm going to start to sew with my stitch length set at zero, zero stitches per inch. Put the needle on the fabric right at that dot, remove the pin, lower the presser foot, and let the needle dance a few stitches just to lock the stitch rather than sewing back and forth. This is more accurate. Now I'm going to punch up my stitch length back to the normal setting and then sew as accurately as possible with the 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance. Just as a quick review, I do have that collar, the, the under collar on the lower layer and just keep sewing from notch to notch. This takes just a touch of time to get these two layers together. We'll restitch this to make certain that it's on straight, but first of all, we'll give it one quick seam. I'm at the center back. And there are a lot of layers of fabric, many curves, so it takes time to fold this so that you're not stitching any tucks or puckers into the fabric. Now I'm getting close to the opposite end of this collar point, and as I started before, I started with my machine set at zero stitches per inch. When I end, I'm going to try to hit that mark just as close as I can, and then change my stitch length to zero, let the needle dance. When I'm finished, then some clipping is in order. And I'm going to clip to the stitching line without without cutting the stitching, clipping through all layers, and then press. When I stitch this, I'm going to place it over again, the pressing ham. And 
you can press it flat and then press it open. And here we're going to press this open all the way along the entire neckline. And again, this is just a step that is not difficult. Just take your time to get it correct. And then as I lift this up, you'll see that there's that 5 eighths of an inch distance between the collar and the jacket. And that's how the collar is applied to the jacket, and the under collar, that is. And now it's time to do the lining unit. Now the best tailoring techniques I know of putting the lining unit together. Let's take a quick look at the finished lining unit. It has the upper collar attached to the facing. The facings and lining are adjoining, and the sleeves are set into place. Basically has all the elements that we worked with earlier for the fashion fabric unit. But the greatest detail that I'd like to change from the traditional methods is attaching the lining to the facings. There are different curves in the pattern design causing sometimes some puckers and problems, but we'll avoid that by using this technique. Let me just show you what I mean. Traditionally, the front facing would be stitched to the back neck facing at the shoulder seams, and it would be attached in all in one unit, and then the lining would have the same stitching, shoulder seams to shoulder seams, and all units then would be attached. Oh, I like to do it separately. Put the front facing to the front lining, the back facing to the back lining, and then stitch the seam, and I'll show you why. It's nice to look at the pattern piece to identify what we're going to do, and I should say fabric piece. Here we have the front facing with a slight inward curve, and the lining has a more definite outer curve. I have my two notches, and I'm simply going to meet them together, but notice when I flip, meeting the right sides, how this outward curve bows. Now we can definitely clip and press and do all sorts of things to get these two to meet, but the easiest thing to do is after pinning the layers as closely and accurately as possible is to stitch with this longer layer the lining next to the feed dogs. Now remember those feed dogs when I was easing in the sleeves, they kind of bit the fabric to ease in extra fullness. Well, it can work to your benefit by sewing with that longer layer on the bottom. So when sewing the facing and the lining, the front facing and the front lining together, this longer layer, the lining, will be lower next to the feed dogs. So just stitch from the hem upward. By the way, one other quick little hem idea is on the lining hem, hem to press up one inch. This will save a nice, this will give you a nice neat finish at the hemline. Think of that before sewing the facings together. Now for the back facing. And here on the front piece, the lining was next to the feed dock. It's going to be the reverse on the lining. But first, let's take a look at that back pleat. You'll traditionally find on a back lining a pleat giving you room to give somebody a hug, to drive your car, reach around. There's just that little extra play. Rather than hand cross-stitching the layers together for this pleat, I've used a decorative stitch from my machine. Choose one of your favorite stitches to stitch something attractive at the pleat at the top of the neckline, waistline, and then again a hemline. But when we lay this flat, you'll see the shape of the neckline. Here we have quite an inward curve. And we get the back neck facing, it's very pronounced outward curve. And to put these two together requires placing, in this instance, the facing toward the feed dog, so the opposite of the lining. And when I move this around, you'll see how the back lining, the, excuse me, the back neck facing seems to be much longer. Actually, the stitching lines are the same length, it's just the seam allowances that are causing problems. So to ease this in without a lot of difficulty, you can see that I'm now stitching with the facing toward the feed dog and the lining upward. And this will so easily fit into place. If we had attached the facings together and the linings together at the shoulder and then stitched this all continuously, in one area it wouldn't ease in very nicely. So this is why I like to do it separately. So once you get the facings attached, and put them together at the shoulder seam, then you can follow some of those same guidelines we went over earlier of setting in the sleeve. Now notice the sleeve does not have a sleeve head or a shoulder pad. You only need one per side, but this lining was eased in using the same manner. The collar, upper collar was attached to the facing using that same technique I detailed 
working with the jacket unit. Now we have a lining unit and a jacket unit. And all the basic construction is completed on these two units. In our next sewing segments, I'll show you how to put these two units together and put the final touches on your best tailored jacket. In today's program, I detailed how to work with the jacket unit and the lining unit to make the best tailored jacket. Remember, you're going to make almost two separate jackets. Each of them has a collar set in sleeves, and next they'll be ready to put together. But one other hint before we go on to the next part, and that is to detail or give it a little extra detail to your jacket. If you recall earlier, I had you do some decorative stitching along the pleat in the back of the lining. But you could also carry that detail through on the lining section where the facing meets the lining by using decorative stitches on your sewing machine, sewing along the lining itself, adding a little extra touch a personalization to this area. It takes about maybe five minutes extra of sewing, but really adds a nice touch. And you get to use some of those stitches that maybe you don't use as often as you do in the, in the past. Next, I'm going to show you how to put the jacket together, sewing the lapel and the collar. But before I do that, I'd like to share with you a word from one of our national underwriters. I'm pleased to introduce Freudenberg Pellon, one of the fine Sewing with Nancy sponsors. Since 1951, the Freudenberg Pellon name has represented the foremost line of interfacings and fusible web products. For fashion sewing, I turn to Pellon products like Soft Shape and Shirt Tailor. When creating craft projects, my choice is Wonder Under, Fusible Fleece, and Stitch and Tear. Freudenberg Pellon continues to be the leader in researching and developing new products for home sewing and crafting. Look to Pellon. I always do. Let me tell you about Nancy's Notions, a Sewing with Nancy sponsor. All the notions I use on my program can be found in my current Nancy's Notions catalog. The 176-page full-color catalog contains over 3,000 items. You can save up to 20% on every order. You can order from the convenience of your own home with our toll-free order line. You'll receive your order fast. Orders are shipped within two working days, and we guarantee all our products. Shop Nancy's Notions. We understand sewing, quilting, and serging. Welcome to Sewing with Nancy, and to our third program of my series, The Best of Tailoring, Making a Tailored Jacket. If you recall, last time I worked with a lining unit and a fashion fabric unit, and I have those samples right here. The outer fashion fabric unit has the under collar attached, the sleeves are set in, basically has all the components of a jacket. The lining unit has the comparable components. The upper collar is attached to the facing, the sleeves, the lining sleeves are attached, and now, with these two jackets, we're going to meet right sides together. And that's today's program. Putting this jacket together at the lapel and collars and giving it the finishing touches that a jacket needs. In about a weekend, you can make a jacket such as this. Sometimes we think of the difficult part of making a jacket is the lapel, the collar, and the facing come together. That will be the first thing I'd like to show you at the sewing machine, how to make this foolproof so it's a perfect lapel. I'll get set up the sewing machine right now. I'm ready to sew the lapel of this jacket. That's one of the first things I do to put these two units together. I have the two jackets pinned together, right sides meeting along the neckline seam. Notice that the seam allowances are pressed open, and my idea was to match the two jackets so that at the lapel points, those two points were meeting about as closely as I could get them to meet. It's something that you'll have to just match them one on top of the other so that those ending points were meeting. Now I'm going to meet the cut edges and pin the lapels together and sew from the edge of the lapel to this point. Now the first time I do this, I really like to use a basting stitch so that if it's not quite right, I can easily take it out. It's a short seam. So I'll set my machine a little longer stitch and sew. Now as I'm getting to the point, which is obviously the part of a tailored jacket that is the most difficult to stitch, I'm going to brush the seam allowances out of the way. Notice that I'm not going to stitch them down or include them in the seam allowance. And as I get to the point, I'll stop and then just let the needle dance in the fabric for two or three stitches to lock it. Cut the threads. That's one, of, one seam of the lapel. Now the second seam is the collar. Do the same type of stitching, meeting the collar edges 
together from the point, or the outer edge, excuse me, to the point. Again, brushing the seam allowances away. And as I'm sewing to this point, I'll again let the needle dance in place. Now, many times I have to sew this a couple of times to get the points matching. But I have, I really appreciate having the jacket points matching. It gives it a more professional look. And then as I'm reaching this point, I'm going to try to stop right on the dot, let the needle dance in place, and we'll check the work. Before checking, I'll remove the neckline pin so I can turn this right side out. Notice it's only attached right now from the collar to the point, neckline to the point. And as I turn right sides out, you will not have white thread on a dark green jacket if you're doing this at home. But I think you'll see that I have a pretty good looking lapel. Nothing has been cut or excited, clipped. There is the facing section. Here is the collar section. And our idea was to allow that these, all these four areas came to meet at this point. It needs to be pressed. It needs some trimming in this area. And that's what I'm going to do at the ironing board. Pressing is as important for tailoring as knowing the correct sewing techniques. And I'm going to place these seams on my pressing pointer and just press flat. And do the same on the lapel. Treat these seams independently. Even though that they are come to a point, it's easier to work with them independently. Notice that at this intersection, we have many, many areas coming together, many, many areas of fabric. That's why it needs to take this special consideration. Then place it open over a pressing point and press once more. And I'll just flip this around to the lapel side and press this open. Now I have my lapels starting to get in position. And the next thing I'll do will be to do trimming. Trim the seam allowances of the lapel to about 3 eighths and to the collar of about fourth of an inch. And the lapel basically will be completed. Next, I'm going to show you how to sew the top of the collar. Off camera, I stitched the other lapel area and did some trimming, and I'd like to show that to you. The lapel seam is trimmed to about 3 eighths of an inch, and both collar seams to about a fourth of an inch. Or you could stagger them, having one side of the collar at 3 eighths and the other side a fourth, just so that this area has some trimming accomplished. In the neckline seam allowance, the upper collar and the under collar seams have been trimmed to about a fourth to 3 eighths of an inch. The seam that is pressed down is left at the total 5 eighths of an inch. You'll see why in a few minutes. Now the next step is to stitch the upper edge of the collar. And to do this, I'm going to start at the collar edge. And then rather than starting at the cut edges, I'm going to wrap the seam allowances toward the under collar. See the white stitching on the fold? That's where I'm going to start to sew. This will assure that I'll be, have a very sharp collar point. Then pin all the collar edges together and sew with the under collar on top. Because the upper collar is generally a little bit longer, and we'd like to have the under collar on top so that the under, upper collar eases into place. I'm going to start to sew at the fold and stitch just that upper collar edge. To save some time, I've already stitched half of this collar off camera, and I'm, you're soon will see that row of stitching. We'll just merge these two stitches together. Now, after doing the stitching of sewing the collar, notice again how this has been wrapped around the edge. I'm going to now press it open, but first press it flat. It always works out better to press it flat, first of all. It sets the stitches in the seam allowance, and just work around this area. And then to press the seam open, I'll slip in the middle of my jacket on the right side point presser. The reason I like sewing a jacket in this manner, kind of one seam at a time, rather than sewing the whole outer edge at once, is that you're able to get into the jacket in the crucial areas and do the pressing. Now I'm just going to press part of this for you. It's pressed completely open, and by working over a presser that's only one inch wide, the edges of the collar will not leave an imprint on the right side of the fabric. 
Then after pressing, we'll do some grating and trimming. Trimming off or angling, cutting off the corner of the collar and then trimming the under collar to the smaller seam allowance. Generally, it seems that the under collar will always have the smaller width, the upper collar just a slightly wider width. I'm trimming off about a fourth of an inch in this instance. You would, of course, do this on both sides. And now, just to see how this looks, we'll turn this right side out and use a point presser. Now, I have white thread in here, so you would normally have matching thread to the fabric. And we're starting to get a jacket that looks like it goes, is going together. On my purple sample, I have already sewn both sides of the collar. And now it's time to attach the collar edges. When I get done with this program, I'll have two gray jackets. You can see that this has been pressed. The upper collar has been pressed. But the collars are not attached at the neckline yet. Notice how this opens up. And all jackets need to be attached at the neckline. There are several ways you can work with this. Either pin the neckline seams of the under and upper collar together and baste through the neckline seam or since I'm not real fond of doing a lot of hand stitching, generally what I like to do is work from the inside of the jacket. And we'll flip this to the inside. And here you can see a whole interesting part of the jacket. We'll tuck the collar and meet the collar's wrong sides together. And these seam allowances represent or are the neckline seam allowances. And I'm simply going to meet the long seam allowances together and pin and pin from the entire neckline, just meeting the collars. Then with your sewing machine, zigzag just these seam allowances together, or straight stitch them. It really doesn't matter. I usually use a zigzag. And on this half of the jacket, they have been sewn together. So that when I flip this to the right side, and you'll see it once again, on this half of the jacket, the collar is attached. And now we're ready to sew the front facing. The last seam to sew the lapel is the center front area. I like to keep this to the very end because having this section open allows me at the ironing board to have the jacket flat. I'm not confined like working in a cubby hole. But now it's time to close it because we're almost done with the lapel. We're going to do a wrap corner just as before. This time at the top of the lapel, not at the collar. Here's my stitching line, the neckline stitching line. And I'm going to wrap the seam allowances toward the jacket. And you'll see on the fold the white stitching. Where I'm going to be starting to sew on that white stitching area. Wrap corners, I think, are such a great invention because they allow us to get very sharp points. Simple as that. Now at the lapel area, at the end of the lapel, notice here, this is where I have the pin marking where the end of the lapel is. You can tell that by the two shades of interfacing, or two layers of interfacing. When I have those two notches meeting and the collar meeting, I find that the facing is longer, or seems slightly longer than the jacket. It's purposely done that way, because the facing, when the jacket is turned right side out, has to roll, and that becomes the outer lapel. So we want to keep that longer, or ease it in, I should say, to the jacket. And I'll do this simply by sewing with this longer layer next to the feed dogs instead of on the top. So through this section, we'll always sew with the jacket section, or excuse me, with the jacket section up, the facing section down. You'll do this on both sides of the jacket. When I start to sew, I'm going to start to sew right at the fold and stitch a simple row of straight stitching. Much of tailoring is just rows and rows of straight stitching, but the sequence of how these stitches are put together is what's important. And if you can, remember to pin so that the pin heads are outward, so that they're easier to grab as you're sewing the seam. I forgot to put one at the end, but we'll make that work. And this is the last row of stitching for the lapel. Of course, you do the same on the other side. As you might guess, after stitching this, we're going to press. Actually, press twice, press it flat, then press it open. If there's anything I can instill upon you in tailoring is to sew once, press twice for each seam.
And at pressing this, using the same techniques we worked with earlier, just press it, not iron, but press it flat. Use plenty of steam. And then after getting it pressed flat, then use a seam roll or a point presser in the, between, in the right side of the fabric and press that seam over that narrow one inch point or the small sleeve roll. Now the reason to work with a smaller pressing surface is to prevent the seam allowances from leaving an imprint on the right side of the fabric. And pressing it flat will make it so much easier when turning this right side out to get a sharp crease line at the stitching. Now you're going to grade your seam allowances using the same grading techniques, making one seam a fourth of an inch wide, the other three eighths, and do clipping, angle clipping at the corner. But just to save time, I'm going to show this to you turned right side out without doing a lot of pressing, or trimming I should say. When this comes right side out, I'll use a turner to get the point nicely inserted. And voila, you can see my lapel. I have the lapel of the collar in the front. And with a few little pressing details and trimming details, this will be complete. And now we'll do the finishing details of the lining. And now for some finishing details on you know, the best Taylor jacket. I'd like to show you how to attach the lining unit and the jacket unit along the hemline. To do that, put on your jacket, enlist the help of a friend, and have your friend smooth the fabric from the neckline to the waistline and pin the two together. We would like the fabrics to be at a one-to-one -one ratio in this area. The reason I'm asking you to do this is it will allow you to easily put in a pleat along the lower edge. And most jackets have an extra pleat along the hemline so that when you put on your jacket or take it off, there's some give. And this will, this will help you create that pleat. Once you do it to the jacket, then also do it to both sleeves around the elbow area. Now, there isn't anyone in this jacket, so it's not as accurate as when you'll be doing this at home. But pin those two layers together and to both sleeves all the way around. Carefully take off your jacket. And when you put it on your work table, you'll see pin marks or pin lines on the inside. Let's see how accurately I have pinned this. And the pin marks are right around the waistline. And these pin marks allow you to take a tuck, about half of an inch to three-fourths of an inch tuck in the lining. Now later on, this tuck will be moved down to the hemline. But by taking up the extra pleat in this area, it will allow you to more readily work at the hem to make it will go together more smoothly. Now you'll notice on this section of the jacket that the hemline has already been hemmed. Just by hand, turn up the right amount of hemline and gently hand stitch, blind stitch the hem to the jacket. Then I've pressed a, just a fourth of an inch of the seam of the lining and it is meeting, just covering the seam allowances of the jacket, not seam allowances, but the finished edge, and pin all layers together. Now this is what's so nice about this technique, is that at this point, you can hand stitch the lining to the jacket, catch it the way you'd like, making some invisible blind hem stitches. Now on this other part of the jacket, I've already worked on this stitching. And because it's been, has this tuck, the upper part of the jacket, it allowed me to work free and flat along the lower edge. Before when I did this, sometimes I'd catch the pleat involved. Now I'm simply going to release these upper tucks and then I'll smooth the lining down. And voila, that pleat that was at the waistline is now at the hemline where it belongs. You can press this lining edge and to make it lie a little bit flatter but that way you'll have that nice pleat at the bottom and you didn't have to worry about getting it out of the way. It was pinned out of the way while you were hemming it. Now, of course, there are many other finishing details. Buttonholes, buttons, of course, finishing the hems at the sleeves. But the other area that I'd like to point out is working with the two jackets at the sleeves. We need them together. So if these two were not pinned together or sewn together, I should say, when you take off your jacket, the lining unit might stay and the jacket unit would come off.
So at the cap of the sleeve, and I'm going to pin through all of these layers, pin through the shoulder pad attaching the lining to the jacket so that you're, they're attached right through this section only. Then with a hand needle and a basting stitch, just attach the layers by sewing through this section, making certain that you have a long thread shank. You don't want to create a dimple in the jacket. You just want to attach them by hand at the cap of the sleeve. At the underarm, you may want to have a little bit more security and match the seam allowances at the underarm. Called stitching in the ditch, match the sleeve and the lining and stitch about an inch on either side of the underarm. The stitching will not show on the right side and on the inside you may see a little machine stitching to hold the two together. And those are some of the important details or finishing details for this jacket. I hope you've enjoyed this three-part videotape on the best of tailoring. You know, tailoring is not something that I do every week. It maybe make one or possibly two tailor jackets a year. But I like using this process because it works for me every time. Remember to use the right interfacings and to use double fusibles where needed to make two jacket units. And then when putting those two units together, instead of sewing the lapel seam in one seam, sew it in four as we did in this last portion of the program. All the details from this program are in the book called The Best of Sewing with Nancy. In Chapter 4, you'll find speed tailoring ideas, and all the ideas that I've shown you today and in this series are in that book. So I hope you use that as a reference. Thanks for joining me on this Sewing with Nancy series. Bye for now. This Sewing with Nancy videotape has been brought to you in part by FOP, simply the best European line of sewing machines. By Pellon, quality products by Freudenberg. By Ginger, a tradition of quality in scissors and shears. And by Nancy's Notion Sewing Catalog, featuring specialty sewing books and notions.